Hello, good evening. Yeah, thank you so much for the intro. Uh, yeah, I'm Tris, Tris Mudford. Um, I'm a software engineer. I work for a company called Motorway in the UK. Uh, and I've building, been building for the web for about 12 years now. Um, and I've always stayed fascinated about this idea that you or I can pull together a website in an evening, we can get it onto a server, we can share that URL with friends or with family into the world. And yeah, I'm here to tell you about one of those side projects called Utopia. Um, and I helped co-found that a couple of years ago. But before that, I just want to tell you a bit of my story and how we got to Utopia. So I started my career in a, a small agency in the south of England. Um, I'll spare my blushes zooming into this photo of me and my questionable choices of facial hair at the time. Uh, but I was fresh out of college and I was, I'd learned a little bit about the web, but not too much. But I was fortunate to land quite a junior role. And it was mostly sort of phone tech support and the odd HTML email. But I also spent that time just poring over the work that the senior engineers were creating at the company and then applying that to my personal site or to side projects until I was trusted to take on a site build of my own. And this was the first commercial site I ever built. And incredibly, somehow it's still live. Um, and this was tough. It, it, was, it was functionally difficult. Property sites are. And I mean, those button styles, they don't make them like that anymore, do they? But forgetting that, it was the first time that I'd worked hand in hand with a designer and I was recreating their design, which was fireworks, Adobe fireworks, if you remember that classic. Um, but it unearthed a load of questions. It was questions like, why is the typography set the way it is? Why were some elements spaced further away than other elements? Why were some box shadows shared, but not in other places? And I wasn't smart enough to be able to answer those at the time or let alone even ask them. Um, but over a couple of projects, I found this groove with the designer. And after a few sites, I knew his style. I knew how, he, how he'd space things, which parts of the design he'd be precious about and which parts he'd be happy for me to sort of challenge him on. In essence, I found, I, I began to understand his design intention and he understood my, de my development capabilities. And together that unlocked this sort of like efficiency and accuracy and we kind of became greater than the sum of our parts. And this idea fascinated me, particularly when I moved to another job and I was working with a new designer and that meant new ways of working, new nuances, new ways to communicate. And it was like we'd had this relationship and then we suddenly had to reset and um, start again. And so I almost liken front end development to like forging signatures. Like I, I'd studied all the intricate details that my first designer had put into their work, the little unique flares that they'd made and I'd gotten really good at forging it or replicating it in the browser. And when I changed jobs, it was as if like I'd nailed my mum's signature to forge school notes. And then suddenly my dad started writing the, the school letters and I had to start again. And this design intention signature change um, means that every single time you change job or someone comes in and out of your teams, you take this little hit on productivity or efficiency or capability. I'm not sure quite what the right word is for this. And I'm not talking about the big picture stuff, like we're all just moving rectangles at the end of the day. I'm talking about like the small details, the quirks, the, the sort of the, int the, um, the intricacies, uh, the intangibles that you can't really pick up on, but make all the difference in terms of sort of like that flow state you can get into as a developer. And this designer and developer relationship just takes time to cultivate. So I thought there must be a way to sort of codify this, this design intention in a way that accelerates that process. Because as front end developers, we have this unique aspect to our job, which is reverse engineering. All engineers have to sort of follow functional requirements. But as front ends, we have this unique step of like visual pattern matching that we have to do before we can write a single line of code. We have to look at a design as a whole and we have to sort of like pull out those common threads where styles are shared across the design, but also not shared and understand why some things may be linked and some things should be kept separate because these details really matter. We know that. You, you probably know that because you're spending your Thursday evening coming to a talk about CSS. Designers spend hours on their designs. They, they make thousands of these like tiny decisions when they're, when they're building out their vision. And I see it as my job as a, as a design engineer or front-end developer to give my best to recreate them, to do their work justice. Uh, and that becomes like a source of personal pride for me. And it's also a question of, maintainability and performance. Like shared styles make refactoring simpler. It means we send less code down the wire. And it's also why we don't just 
copy and paste CSS straight out of Figma dev mode and ship it to the browser. We know there's more nuance to it than that because front-end development isn't a copy and paste job. I mean, thank goodness it would be out of a job before AI, AI came along. It's this step of translation. We're translators as design engineers. We take what is static and we breathe responsive life into it. Uh, and in my experience over these past 12 years or whatever, it's a whole lot easier to perform that translation step if both design and development are built atop a shared system. Uh, and that is the backdrop to Utopia. So getting on to Utopia itself. Um, my good friend James Gilliard and I launched Utopia in late 2019. And we were both working at the time at the brilliant UK design transformation agency called Clearleft down in Brighton. And although it has a website and various tools, Utopia isn't really a product. It's an approach to fluid responsive design. And it came from all those years of failure and forging and reasoning and refining. And I want to underline that it's an approach, not the approach. There is never one approach to creative problems. Uh, it would be so easy for me to sit here and show you some tooling and say, this is the solution to your responsive design problems, but that would be totally disingenuous. The real solution to your responsive design problems is simply better communication between design and engineering. That's probably the takeaway from tonight anyway. Um, and hopefully Utopia can be the start of that conversation. So we called it Utopia kind of as a joke really to begin with, but it's kind of just gotten out of hand from here. But it describes this state where designers and developers have such a clear understanding that there is harmony between the disciplines, like a shared flow state. That point where a designer trusts that a developer can fully deliver on their vision and a developer can deeply understand what a designer has created. And we wanted to codify that feeling or at least try and make it more repeatable. In other words, it's designers and engineers singing from the same style sheet. And the main foundations to design are type, space, and color. Uh, these, these underpin everything we do. And yet so many projects aren't built on well-defined solid foundations. And if we're trying to reverse engineer systems onto a design that's not been built systematically, we're kind of onto a, onto a bad start. And um, so we thought if we could encapsulate those foundations into a sort of set of common language, then we might be onto something. And Utopia is part of that encapsulation. It's type and space against the axis of viewport. It's a systematic approach to fluidity in responsive design. And instead of designing for a number of arbitrary breakpoints, we design a system or a set of rules in which elements can scale proportionally and fluidly. And hopefully this will help you design and code more minimally, streamline your collaboration between design and engineering, and start to ensure some visual harmony across your products. But you might be thinking, I thought we'd already sold responsive design back in 2010 when Ethan Marcotte wrote that article. Um, but I think the responsive design that we've stopped at isn't necessarily the complete solution. Because if we go back and look at the, the opening to Ethan's article, he starts by quoting John Alsop from a whole 10 years prior to that, which now 24 years ago, crazily, that we must accept the ebb and flow and embrace the fact that the web doesn't have the same constraints as print. And yet I find that we're still designing for the same set of breakpoints that are decided by our CSS frameworks. We're still shipping substandard responsive experiences a lot of the time, and we're still designing far too many static screens in our designs tools. So let's begin to focus on typography. Um, we're gonna rewind back to the time of movable type and letterpress printing, where there'll be distinct type sizes in the form of metal presses and every point size would equal more expensive metals. So they needed a subset of, uh, of sizes then. But in the, in the digital age, there's an infinite number of type sizes available to you. And I'm sure you've all worked on projects where it feels like there's an infinite number of type sizes in play. And you'll know that it's hard to maintain, but it's also visually confusing because there's no clear hierarchy on the page. Um, and we're gonna call this state today, bespoke chaos or just chaos. Um, this is the state where there is no system, where every single piece of type and space is designed in total isolation and it needs to be measured or more commonly guessed at by developers. And this is the wild west, but it is surprisingly common, particularly in sort of single, single person design teams where you might hear quotes like, we don't need a design system, it would limit our creativity. Um, 
I'm putting this here because I want to I want to outline that the approach towards having a fluid space system or type system is a journey. And it's not like we can pick it up at any point along this journey. Hopefully in these states, you will sort of identify where your organizations are and we'll work out what we can do about that. Um, so we need to add some constraints to this process. Constraints reduce clutter, they simplify design. So let's get started. So we're gonna pick our typeface. Um, you probably know that from your company brand. Uh, this is just gonna be a contrived example tonight, um, but you need to find the font size that feels readable on your smallest screen. And this is all dependent on your typeface, your branding, your audience. So there's no one size fits all solution here. But for the sake of simplicity, we're gonna say that our smallest screen is 320 pixels and our body size looks perfect at 16 pixels. Um, this is also a great time to have a look at line height and just get body size if you were reading an article looking absolutely tip top. Once you've decided that body size, the next step will be to decide heading sizes. So enter the modular scale. Um, a modular scale is created by using a consistent multiplier to define a set of numbers. And these numbers naturally grow as the sequence continues, uh, as opposed to a fixed interval system like the four pixel, easily divisible four pixel grid system. Um, but not only do modular scales provide constraints, they also encourage visual harmony. So in music, harmony is the act of combining multiple pitches together to create a cohesive and a full experience. And it's rooted in the very sort of foundations and fabrics of our physical world. And we could express the relationship between any two musical notes in, in Hertz as a fraction. Um, and there are certain strong relationships that we would tend to view as particularly solid harmony. Uh, so we've got a, a perfect fit here, A to E, which as a fraction can be uh, expressed as three to two, as an, as an integer is 1.5. Um, and using these strong harmonic multipliers is a good starting point, but ultimately the key is to consistently use that multiplier along a type scale, as we're going to see. If you begin to deviate from that scale, that's when disorder can start to creep in. So we're going to start from our body size of 16 pixels at 320 pixels, and we're going to multiply it by a major second scale, or 1.125. So along the top, we do the multiplier, and underneath we've got the gap between the uh, steps on the scale. So we can start at 16, go to 18, 20.25, 22.78, and so on. You'll see the gaps just subtly increase as we head along the scale. If we were to use the same origin, 16 again, but use a perfect fifth, 1.5, we're going to have much more dramatic results here. The gaps are going up 8, 12, 18, 27, and so forth. So you can see that a higher multiplier is going to create dramatic results the further along you go. So let's find a middle ground here. Um, and this you'd want to decide within your design tool or in the browser. Um, so as long as you adhere to these steps, we can use 1.25 here, your type is going to feel what we call harmonious or in tune with itself. Uh, so this is yeah a reasonably sensible scale we're just going to take for our contrived example today. So a common step, misstep, let's say, is to assign these sizes to elements. Uh, so step five will get applied to H1, step four to H2s, and down to paragraph. And this is probably all well and good in the medium of print, but we live in a responsive age. And if you make that decision to apply a type scale to elements, we call this state undesirable layouts, where your headings have been designed for a specific size and they just feel wrong on other viewports. So we, we tend to get around this by using like industry standard breakpoints to map heading sizes to other heading sizes, which adds this confusion between semantics and size. And this is quite a normal thing to see in a design system. But when you say it out loud, our heading one is a heading three on mobile, and our heading one is a heading one on desktop, it just sounds a bit ridiculous and overcomplicated. But it's it's scarily common. I mean, full transparency, this is what happens at the motorway design system at the moment. We are still on this on this journey here. But this mental arithmetic means that it's no surprise that inconsistencies and mistakes creep in, but it sort of it sort of appears to work. So if we have a look at this, mobile looks good. We've got our heading three on our heading one, of course, but we'll gloss over that. And on the large screen, we've got our heading one as our heading one. And this all looks about right, but if we just squish the browser to the point where we make that jump and we go one pixel either side, we end up with this problem here, where you have to make that decision where to 
switch between your large and your small uh, type scales. But inevitably, one pixel too low and everything's going to look too small. One pixel too high and everything's going to look too big until you get to those sort of poles. So we affectionately call this state broke points. And broke points merch is now available online. Um, so what do we do? We, 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 of course, we design more. That's what we tend to do as an industry. We now design a tablet size and a small desktop and a big desktop and a small mobile. And you get the idea. We've entered the age of busy work where designers are mindlessly churning out screens, setting what they view as the best size per viewport, and then developers are spending hours matching them. And you think that by adding more breakpoints, you're adding more control, but in reality, you're just adding more inconsistencies, more code, and now you've got like six designs to maintain rather than two. But this is sadly the reality for many design systems. And the FIGMA files I've seen that are like this matrix of screens and then sizes going down there and it's just so much so much work that causes misery to all and it costs so much money so it's clear to me at least that doubling down on broke points is not the answer so how do we break free from that so rather than imposing more control we need to take a step back and relinquish control we need to create declarative rules that govern our system because css is declarative not imperative it's designed it's not designed to be tied down with every single viewport tied out and plotted. It's meant to be described. Or as Andy Bell says, be the browser's mentor, not its micromanager. So going back to our example, let's swap those HTML elements out for step numbers. Um, so this is going to help us just ab abstract semantics away from sizing. Um, and we chose this type scale in, with good intentions at 320 pixels. So let's create another one, but this time for our largest device. So we're going to start again with our body size, step zero, and we're going to pick the perfect readable size for that screen. Um, that might be a laptop. It might be a widescreen TV. You'll know your audience better than any front-end framework can suggest a top breakpoint. So choose the, choose the maximum viewport that works for your, product, uh, for your project. And once you've got that body size nailed, you can choose a modular scale that creates the right amount of drama for that, for that space. Uh, so for this example, our step zero is now 20 pixels, and we have a multiplier of 1.333. If we pull that all together, we have six values. Uh, we have a min and max for a viewport, 320 and let's say 1240. Uh, we have a body size going from 16 to 20, and we have two type scales, 1.25 and 1.33. And if we pop these into utopia.fyi, um, you get you get this. You put them in that blue bar on the top, and you get uh, all the all the steps on your type scales mapped out for you. You can do ten above and ten below if you really wanted to. So the clever bit is what happens in between. So rather than put a load of broke points in between those values, we want to let the computer to do some to do some work. Because computers are great at doing maths, and I don't want to be doing maths. So we're going to offload all those calculations onto there, away from our brains and into the browser. So we're going to design the best possible type scale for the smallest and the largest viewports. And we're going to let the browser handle everything in between. And at every single viewport, every pixel between the min and the max is a custom type scale. What's the multiplier? Who knows and who cares, frankly? The crucial thing is it's consistent. Every step on the scale uses a custom modular scale to ensure that that type looks as in tune as it possibly can do given the current viewport. And we've not imperatively imposed the scale on every single pixel, that'd be mad. But we've just described this rule and let the browser play it out for us. And this is the result. Um, this is just a basic type scale put onto some uh, copy here. And our body size just naturally makes a small uh, increase in size, but obviously that heading one there is growing quite dramatically across the, uh, across the viewports here. And we get this all effectively for free. So we've made it to systematic heaven, as it were. Um, so how do we actually apply this? Right, I know we're at a CSS meetup and I've been going 20 minutes and I'm not showing you any CSS yet. So we're nearly there. But um, given that we spend like half of our lives in design tools, I just want to just take a nod to design um, because I think it's, it, it's in our interest to understand how a design document has been laid out to extract the most sort of a design intention out of it. So we've provided all these values between for mins and maxes here, but transferring those into a design tool is quite laborious. 
Um, particularly if you're in that ideation phase where you're still trying to work out what's the right type scale for my two viewports. So we've created a Figma plugin here uh, to do some of the hard work for you. Um, you can find it on the Figma uh, plugin registry. And when you run it, you get this little window here. Um, and you can pass in those six values um, into those inputs underneath there. Uh, you can also just paste the URL from the Utopia calculator into that top section, and it will configure the calculator for you. And just because we wanted to make it sort of cyclical, you, any changes you make there will also get updated to the input for that URL, and then you can paste that and get back to where you were. Um, so hitting go does a few things. It generates a little settings artboard on the left. That's like a source of truth. Um, so any changes you make there, if you rerun the plugin, will get uh, laid out. But then it's going to generate a min and a max artboard for you as well. Um, and for each one, it does some default copy, a prose sort of style copy, and strong heading style copies. And uh, just a quick one, note changing that we've used Inter on there because Inter is a lovely font, but obviously not all brands use Inter. So um, there's a, a little uh, utility plugin here where you can select all the types, uh, type sizes or type scale uh, styles, that's the word, isn't it? Um, hit run and just change all of the typefaces in one go. It really should be in core Figma UI, but the UI is a bit clunky at the moment. So we also generate uh, type styles for all of those sizes. So here we've got uh, U, like a namespace of U for type, uh, our max size, and this is our strong or our heading style. They get applied to those previous uh, screens, but also then you can click on any element when you're designing. And on the right-hand side, you just get a nice plain English version of uh, the, the, the scale you're looking at. There's no magic numbers floating around. It's all replaced with this shared language. So I can see that it's step five on the large screen mockup, which means I also know what it's going to look like on the small screen mockup. And that's the power of fluid type. Right, I promise we get to some code. Here we go. Here's how you can apply it. It's really nice and simple. Um, there's a custom property here for step four. Um, and we're using it, this is a utility sort of approach. Uh, you can use utility approach if you wanted to. Uh, you could also use just normal sort of BEM or whatever other methodology, or you could use both, why not? Um, but yeah, this is just a uh, utility here, say font size is step four, and we can just apply that to our various bits of HTML. And because we've separated that semantic from sizing, we can use the right semantic element for every component we build, and then just sort of layer on the sizing as appropriate. If you're using Cube CSS or BEM or any other type of uh, methodology, implementing it is nice and straightforward. Again, we have our card title class, and we just say font size step three. And just a quick aside, um, using that shared language then between design and development makes those snagging discussions you have with designers really easy because there's no magic numbers of like, can we make that element that was 13.4 pixels, 16.2 pixels? It's, can we change that heading up a step or down a step? Um, because we're both using the same system, those discussions can just happen easily around the developer's desk. Um, and then they can designers can bring those changes back into their tool. Like right? As developers, we can have agency to make like informed design changes and that they can be reflected back into Figma or our design tools really easily. But yeah, going back to those CSS uh, properties there, you might wonder how those are generated. Well, Utopia began in 2019, uh, and this was before Clamp landed in any major browsers. So we started out using an approach called CSS locks. Um, these were coined by Mike Reesmuller in 2015, and they look a bit like this. Uh, this is a CSS lock, uh, and it's interpolating between 16 pixels and 20 pixels between the sizes of 320 and 1240. So this is our step zero we've been talking about tonight. Um, and then, that's what's happening in that sort of gnarly looking uh, calculation there. And then underneath, we've got this lock um, that's at, without, without having that lock, it would just keep growing infinitely. So it's saying at 1240, cap it off at 20 pixels, don't get any bigger. And in the past, we would have turned to SAS mixins to um, encapsulate all this boilerplate code. And I remember doing this back, at, back in the day and being really excited about this and applying it to everything. And then finding I had several hundred media queries in my style sheet. So, Mike didn't have access to uh, custom properties back in the day. So 2019 felt like the right time to refactor that lock. And we're gonna do that right now. So let's be good citizens. Let's convert our, rem, our pixels over to rems so that they can be um, 
scaled with uh, user Zoom preferences, browser Zoom preferences. And let's make a bit of space because we're going to do some moving around of CSS and it might get a little bit tricky to follow, but hang in there. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to extract that calculation and we're going to pull it up into a custom property. We're going to call it fluid BP for breakpoint. Um, so a bit of fun note here. Uh, I think it's fun anyway. Because it's going inside a calc, you don't actually need to put calc on the uh, custom property definition. It just gets rid of a bit of a bit of stuff. It's a fun little quirk of uh, CSS custom properties. And this already looks more readable, uh, but let's keep going down another level. So we're going to pull the uh, max width out, 77.5, meaning 1240 pixels. Um, and we're also going to pull out 100 VW. I'm not going to pull out 20 because 320 is kind of a reasonably well agreed upon minimum uh, minimum size anyway. Um, annoyingly, we still can't quite do uh, custom properties in media queries. So we've got a bit of duplication down in that media query, but let's look over that for now. So the interesting thing for me here is there's an opportunity for some inversion of control. Um, so in the media query, we're currently saying if the media if the browser is wider than 1240, make this paragraph 1.25 rem. And you can see how that just doesn't scale as we add 100 uh, CSS locks. But if we do something sneaky here, we can look at this 100 VW unit and see that this is acting as the source of truth for how wide the browser is. But by extracting it into a variable, it means we can change it. So check this out. Um, if you lock, instead of locking the font size down, we can lock the concept of our screen down. So now we're saying, if the viewport is 1240 or wider, Pretend the viewport is actually 1240. This then cascades into our fluid breakpoint custom property, and then in turn that cascades into our CSS lock. And this inversion of control is super powerful. So if we swap these two around, because now this media query is only relating to the section above it, we can also move our, uh, our calculation up into a, its own custom property. So step zero is now a custom property. And now we can just create more CSS locks, as many as we like. And they're all locked by one media query. So this is how we can remove potentially hundreds of media queries from our CSS just by using the power of the cascade. Um, and because these calculations are still quite hefty, there is a generator. We're going to get to that in a second uh, that, that does this for you. But you can see how we kind of arrived at this uh, conclusion here. But then Clamp came along and kind of nullified quite a lot of that. Um, and it changed the game for fluid CSS. Um, so clamps accept three parameters, uh, a min, a max, and an ideal uh, size. And the browser's always trying to render at the ideal size, but then locking off those two poles either side. Um, so calculating the ideal bit in clamp is quite complicated, and there's a few ways we can do it. Um, unfortunately, someone much smarter than me helped us all out here. Uh, Pedro Rodriguez wrote this article uh, in 2020 about how to cal calculate that ideal size. And he gave this equation here, which is way beyond my sort of secondary school level math skills. Uh, but fortunately, we know all the values going into this. It's max sizes, max widths. Like we know those sorts of things. So we can replicate it in CSS. But the problem is it looks like this. And no one wants to be dealing with calculations that look like that. Like we all know clamps are bad to begin with, but that's no better. And it gets even worse if you try and extract all the bits of it out into custom properties so you can um, keep control of it. So we tend to pre-calculate clamps. Um, of course, the trade-off here is reversibility. Getting back to those values that went into the clamps is pretty much impossible, uh, which is why we also include that comment at the top there to get you back to the calculator so you can make any changes. Um, so that's the point of design tokens. We can change them after the fact. They're not consts. So um, yeah. So which should you use in 2024, um, clamp or CSS locks? And of course, with this being a web talk, the answer is it depends. Um, clamps are more succinct, um, they are more web native, but as well as being less reversible, they also have a couple of drawbacks. Uh, one is browser support and one is accessibility. Um, Safari on iOS, I think 13.4 is the cutoff. Um, that might not be a concern for you. Uh, I think in our company, 13.1 is what we're currently looking at. Hopefully that will shift up a little bit soon, um, but that might be a reason to either use uh, static fallbacks on the custom properties, because custom properties are great like that, or use uh, CSS locks. And the second potential drawback is around accessibility. Um, Adrian Rosselli has been tirelessly warning about this for several years and the dangers of clamp and accessibility. Um, WCAG has this success criteria on 1.4.4, .4, uh, 
um, that says, except for captions and images of text, text must be resizable without assisted technology up to 200% without loss of content or functionality. And this can cause a problem for fluid type, particularly if you're using quite dramatic differences between min and max sizes or further up the type scale. Um, and this, in, this, is, this issue derives from this interplay between uh, viewport units and browser zoom. Because when you zoom in on a browser, the rem values, they, they get larger, but the viewport units don't because a viewport is a viewport. 1% has to always equal 1%. But if we look at this clamp, we've got both in play here. We've got a rem unit and a VI unit. So as we zoom in, like the equation gets in balance. So we're only like zooming in half of the equation, which is normally a problem because a browser's let us zoom into like 500%. We only need to get to 200%. So that usually kind of masks the issue. But if you're using a really dramatic type scale, that's where the, the higher up steps can begun, begin to be sort of not resizable enough. Uh, at those wider viewports. So if you're generating a type scale on Utopia, we are going to warn you, or we do warn you, if any of those steps fail, and you can um, check that out and uh, try and find a solution for that. CSS locks, on the other hand, they are more verbose, but they still have merits on their own right. So I use them to build the Utopia homepage here, where you can uh, drag a little range slider, and everything moves in and out, and all the type and space scales accordingly. Um, and yeah, this is written in Vue.js. Um, so just quickly going through this, we have the CSS, which is pretty much what we've already seen. We're using a min width here as well as a max width. Um, and we set the width of the demo to be the fluid screen size. And then we have some state uh, in Vue just to give us something to lock onto with our, our input type range. And then we have this input type range, which is mapped onto that uh, screen state. Um, and then we set the a CSS custom property of fluid screen to the width of the screen size. So it starts off at 686 pixels. And then as you uh, shift in and out, it moves the screen, which gives us this effect as you move in and out, we're moving the width of the screen, but we're also sort of changing in the eyes of all the CSS within, we're changing what the concept of the screen is. And so it renders accordingly as if it were on that viewport. And yeah, I thought this was quite exciting. So I explored this idea a little bit further to try and create some sort of space aware components. This was before um, container queries came along and changed the game again. Um, but by setting that fluid screen property in a sidebar, you could shrink all the components within it to render as if they were on a viewport of the width of that sidebar. Um, and all that, although that I didn't really take off, I'm now using that same technique um, with web components and uh, container queries. So this is a imaginary component, component that is quite similar to one that I built at work, but I'm not able to use the same image. Um, it's a pretty standard sort of newsletter sign up thing, uh, but this has uh, a Rex requirement that it needs to be portable to any website and be able to be able to be put in any position. So I thought about different ways to tackle this. Um, could use an iframe, which kind of renders a viewport within a viewport. Um, and it does keep things encapsulated, but I needed to post something from this form, like proper form post. So iframes can't do that out of the, out of the box. So I decided upon a web component and Shadow DOM keeps the styles from coming in and out. Uh, and this component uses clamp for fluid type and it looks nice on big screens and it looks nice on small screens. And then you decide, oh, we're gonna put the big one inside a column um, on a big screen and it all falls apart immediately. Um, so this is because we're using as uh, twofold, really. One, we're still showing that illustration underneath uh, because it thinks it's on a big screen. And the other thing is that the type is just way too big because the type is scaled to the viewport, not to the container. Uh, and we're putting something that's designed to be used on a big screen into a small space and everything sort of explodes out. So the answer is container queries. Um, so after years of waiting, they are finally here. Um, and they brought along this fun new unit, CQI, um, and where viewport units are calculated as a proportion of the whole viewport, CQI units are calculated as a proportion of the named container. Um, so on that top line there, we opt in to container queries here, saying container type, inline size, and then we're going to have our all of our steps um, generated from Utopia underneath using viewport units. These are a great fallback. If it all goes wrong, the content still works. It still works. Um, but then we can use a support query. If the browser supports font size one CQI, then we're going to override those queries, um, but in the, those custom properties. But instead of using the viewport unit, we're going to use the CQI unit. 
And then finally, we have a little container query at the bottom that says when the container drops below a certain width, we can hide the illustration. And this gives us that effect here. So this has become a really portable little web component. I can paste it onto any site and in any position on any site and go into a sidebar. It can go onto a full width. It can go wherever you like. Wherever I render it, it's going to stay proportional to itself rather than to the whole page. And because this is kind of like an encapsulated website within a website, that kind of makes sense. I'm not saying this is the approach for everything, but there are use cases where using container queries and Utopia together works quite nicely. Um, so generators, very quickly on this, um, we have got some tools. Let's not get hung up on tooling, as I said before, but um, this is a good place to get started. So if you're using CSS locks or clamp, we've got those options there at the top, uh, the controls for the container query versus the viewport. Um, we also have a, a SAS version. So if you don't want to be copying and pasting CSS, um, we have SAS generators and there's a post CSS generator as well. Um, and these let you pass in that like a configuration object and then that can be versioned. Everything gets built at build time and it keeps everything repeatable. Um, yeah, the post CSS version is a, a similar one. Uh, they also include a few helpers for writing slightly more readable clamps. Uh, post CSS one is particularly fun here because you can set config at a site level, you can set your project min and max widths, and then you can just write utopia.clamp between X and Y, um, and out will come a nice clamp because no one likes writing clamps or no one can remember how to get back to the original values or know what they did. So um, yeah, that's a fun little side benefit of the PostCSS Utopia plugin. We also have Utopia Core, uh, which is a JavaScript TypeScript library for doing all the calculations, and that's powering a lot of the plugins under the hood. Um, so hopefully that can uh, get thing, get more generators spun up quickly. And this has already come into effect. I think I've seen Agor online tonight. Um, he took the Utopia Core plugin and he created a, a style dictionary, Amazon style dictionary generator in just a handful of lines of code. Uh, so we've also got community plugins for Tailwind and StyleX and any others. And if you want to make some generators, grab Utopia Core and give it a go. Um, and we find this really exciting because it's, this is like the mindset of Utopia trumps the tooling of it. Um, because we all have tools, but ultimately they are just like ephemeral fleeting things that will ultimately kind of um, be, be discontinued. We want to, if you're, if you're embracing fluidity in the browser and that idea of shared language between design and development, then the tools don't really matter. Right, we've made it through type, we're onto space and don't worry, we're actually not looking at color today because we've not looked at that yet, but maybe in the future. So space, it's it's easy to overlook space as like a fundamental, like the lack of something, how can the lack of something be something? But it really is the heart of design, but because it's intangible, it's hard to articulate. So tools like the, the four pixel grid system do help in that they limit the palette for us, but they're not responsive and they encourage the use of more break points. So Utopia looks to solve this by creating fluid space palettes that shared, are shared between design and development. And of course, Robert Bringhurst bringing the truth uh, when he talks about uh, the paralyzing numbers of a uh, paralyzing choice of limitless space and how we can solve it with a few proportional intervals. So let's start with a proportional interval. Uh, this is our body size that we've been looking at tonight, 16 to 20. Um, and this space we're going to call small. And this is directly tied to our type scale. Uh, so it has a really strong relation to, to, relationship to it. Um, and we could use those clamps that we were using for type as our space units, but we found that kind of the useful spaces like exist along a bell curve. Like you want more spaces around the small space than you do at the at the edges. Um, so we use multipliers instead, and we label them with t-shirt sizes. Um, in this case, say medium here is a 1.5 times, but you can make it 1.25, you can make it 1.75, whatever you like. Um, and you'll see that every space has like a natural flex to it. Um, and this is because it's tied to our type scale. So our, our, uh, our Excel space actually ranges from 48 pixels to 60 pixels on a larger screen. So let's have a look at a quick example. This is a pretty standard card component. This is a, a small screen design, uh, and it's got an image that's got an aspect ratio attached to it. Um, and then the content has padding on it and some vertical spacing. So if we visualize this space with um, our named sizes, we can say that it has a small padding, and it has two excess spacing or, or gap. And we can name and describe everything on this component. There are no magic numbers, just named spaces. 
And in our design tools, you could hover over that space and see, oh, it's a, it's a space of S. Uh, this becomes, yeah, it, it, it's a limited palette for the designers, but it's really powerful because it becomes shared. And in CSS, we simply just paint on the space that we want with custom properties. And that's what it feels like when you use the Utopian space system. It's like I'm holding it like a palette of really beautiful spaces and I can just paint them onto the right parts of the DOM. Uh, it's, it's super empowering. And what's really cool is I get stuff for free here. Uh, because all the spaces are naturally fluid and you don't have to write a media query, you get this sort of like inevitable large screen de design. Um, so it doesn't quite design itself, but um, we get this natural flex happening automatically. So when we turn off the, um, the, the, turn off the, the visualized space, we just have this beautiful card that's catered for us with just a handful of custom properties. It's really elegant. But you might be thinking, that's not a great deal of flex, like four pixels between things, which is why we offer more interpolations between spaces. So we call these single step pairs. So this is small to medium, medium to large, large to extra large, et cetera. Um, and yeah, these give scope for bigger differences between your mins and your maxes. And then furthermore, you can define custom spaces for any of your, uh, any between any of your spaces. So any use case you can imagine. I like using small to large for like vertical or uh, horizontal gutters on the page, or you might do section padding uh, as a, I don't know, small to three XL. Um, and you can name whatever design tokens you like off the back of these. So let's have a quick look at a custom space in action. Uh, this is a hero component. This classic one we sort of see on top of the home page. And these are the sorts of components that you would traditionally just write so many media queries to gradually step up and step down. Um, I've now written hundreds of those over the years, um, but it's way more declarative with CSS. So we're going to use a large space here for vertical padding. Obviously, there's going to be more spaces across this, but let's just focus on the padding because that's the classic culprit for media queries. So out of the box, we kind of get this inevitable design on larger screens. Um, the problem is, I don't think that provides enough drama, and I'm sure the designers would agree. Um, so we want to step it up, and usually this means adding some more breakpoints, um, and then at some point you'll just arbitrarily step up. But with the fluid space scale, we just change the token. So when we change the token from large to large to a large 2XL, it doesn't change anything on our small screens, but on our large screen, it's like the angle of attrition gets ramped up and everything just naturally has more space to play with. We're using larger screens, there's more screen available, so it makes sense. And of course, it's as simple to apply as that. It's just a clear, plain text explanation, a space that is large to 2XL. And it's clear to everyone what's going to happen in between that. Uh, of course, there are generators for space units, uh, same as uh, Clamp. Uh, so we've got, yeah, we've got Clamp, we've got CSS locks, SAS, post CSS, all the things. Um, Quickly on, on this, you've got this choice between rems and pixels. Um, we do impose rems on typographic uh, scales that get generated for, from an accessibility, accessibility perspective, but you have the choice with space scales. Um, so when you zoom in with your browser zoom settings, any rems are going to get bigger, as I said earlier, um, because the root end gets larger. And that might be fine for vertical spacing, that stuff gets pushed down, but you might run into some problems with horizontal spacing here. Um, because as you zoom in, stuff is going to get pinched. Um, so you might find that you want to try using uh, a different, you could either create two sets of tokens, a, a like an accessible or a, 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 yeah, an accessible palette that's made with, um, with, with pixels that remain static, and then a fluid one that stays with rems, or you could even create two sets of uh, spaces, one for horizontal and one for vertical. Uh, choice is kind of up to you. And with fluid responsive design, every piece of type and space gets in accounted for. Uh, these space units can be applied to anything you normally use a, a length unit on. So like transforms, paddings, margins, grid gaps, borders, line height, anything you fancy. And this kind of shows how effective it becomes when you scale it out to a whole page. Um, and remember, this is all being controlled with one media query, or even clamp case, no, no media queries. It's super effective. And if every space and type is named within the design tool, it means I don't actually need a large and a small screen mockup necessarily, but the results on all devices becomes predictable. And with fluid space scales and type scales, everything you can, you can kind of design or build from either end of the component, and it's going to be clear to, to everyone what's going to happen on the other end. And then when you have exceptions to those rules, 
that's when you can always view them as like little git little git diffs like small clearly highlighted areas that need more attention where you're going to intentionally break some rules and that's the real power of designing a building with well documented rules um, the design intention becomes clear for everyone and when you and your designers realize and sort of trust this system you'll be able to shortcut so much of that busy work that goes on and you can focus on the ux and the business problems that actually matter and this is how that common language and shared understanding can really unlock that efficiency and accuracy as you probably gleaned by now, uh, Utopia doesn't look like anything. Uh, we've got this little showcase on Utopia to test that. There's all manner of sites on here, uh, web apps and blogs and everything in between. Um, but these are all sites where the creator has sent them into us because we honestly have no idea how many Utopia sites are out in the wild because we use copy and paste as our method of sharing CSS for quite a while. Um, but what's anecdotally interesting to me is I can tell when a site feels Utopian before I check the CSS to see what's actually going on under the hood. And more often than not, I'm right about that hunch because there's something in the balance that those mathematically sound type scales and space units bring to a page on whatever device you're using. Um, and as I said at the start, the tooling is a means to an end. Although we've got some tools, they're entirely optional. I'd far rather you understand this mindset and the approach rather than pick up yet another front end tool. Because I really do believe that fluid responsive design is powerful, it's efficient, and it fosters great collaboration in our product teams. So thank you so much for giving up your Thursday evening uh, to listen to me waffle on about CSS and design engineering. Uh, thank you for CSS Cafe for inviting me here. I really do appreciate it. Um, you can find even more detail online, should you wish, at utopia.fyi. Uh, I'm online at trismudford.com. Um, always very happy to discuss fluid responsive design, CSS on social media and stuff. So ping me if you have any questions. So thank you so much for listening.